Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Evan. If you don't know me, uh, I'm a member here of Redemption Heights Church, uh, and I have the pleasure of giving uh, you the sermon tonight. Uh, I will warn you, first off, that there will be several Blue's Clues moments tonight, and what I mean by that, if you remember the old kids' show, Blue's Clues, uh, the hosts, Steve and Joe, uh, right, they would, they would ask questions to the audience and they would have this three to four second pause for kids or adults who are watching to, to answer and to interact uh, with the show. And it's one of the reasons why it was so popular was because they introduced this pause into the show. And so tonight I'll do a little bit of that. I'll ask you questions and pause awkwardly for four or five seconds so you can kind of participate uh, at home and hopefully this becomes as popular as Blue's Clues. But tonight I've um, entitled the message, Rest Assured, Rest Assured. And we're continuing on in the theme of opposing Jesus. We've been in Matthew 11 a few uh, weeks now. And we've been looking at different people uh, that have been opposing Jesus and his ministry in different ways. And so tonight uh, we'll continue on with that. And the, and the passage we'll be looking at tonight comes from Matthew 11 verses 25 to 30. So I will read those and pray and we'll get started. So Matthew 11, 25 to 30 says this. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, because this was your good pleasure. All things have been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son desires to reveal him. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdens, and I will give you rest. All of you take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's pray. Father, rest is something that our souls, uh, every one of our souls longs for. Jesus, you, you say here that you are at the center of that, that all of our longings are met in you. I pray that this word would just penetrate every, every heart that hears it, uh, that they can put down their plows, they can stop searching, uh, because we know it's found in you, Lord. So would you use me, uh, speak through me by your spirit, what do you want to communicate tonight from your word? I ask this in your name. Amen. So there's kind of two parts here, uh, I think. So 25 to 27 and 28 to 30 are kind of the two, the two parts. So the first section we'll, we'll focus on is 25 to 27. Uh, and I'm calling that section uh, the relationship of rest. Uh, and so uh, the passage starts out with Jesus praying to his father and I want to kind of make that a bit of a big deal that he's praying to his father. And I know that's kind of obvious. You know, who else would he be praying to, Evan? Um, but this section is really going to usher us to see this beautiful and intimate picture that Jesus has with his father. And so we're going to unpack that a little bit. Uh, but the first point I want us to notice is that Jesus is praying to his father, the Lord of heaven and earth. Then it goes on to say, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned, and the, the, these things that are in this passage are really just the revelatory things of Jesus. It's, it's the message of Jesus coming, taking on flesh, to bear the burden of our sin and rose again. Uh, think of John 3.17, I believe it is, that God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn it, but through him that he might save the world. That this is the these things that are hidden from who? They're hidden from the wise and the learned. And so the context here, what Pastor James taught on last week uh, in the verses just above this, uh, that Jesus was doing all these clear signs and miracles in different cities and towns throughout Israel. But the, the passage, and we, what we learned last night is that the people didn't recognize them. The people rejected the message and they didn't repent and turn to Jesus we think even more broadly, the, the Pharisees, who are these religious elite, these teachers who know the law, the Mosaic law, uh, forwards and backwards, that they themselves, who were probably the most wise and learned people of their time uh, among the Jewish crowd, that they too did not recognize Jesus for who he was and who he said uh, he would be. And so 
when we look at our culture today, we're not all that different, that we love new information, right? We love learning. Some of you are watching this uh, on YouTube. Uh, and so here's a stat uh, for you. Uh, and here it is, the, the tonnage of new video content uploaded to YouTube in the next 58 hours would require an unbroken lifespan of 80 years to watch all of it. 80 years, next 58 hours, hardly over two days, a whole lifetime. And it's no wonder how easy it can be to miss Jesus amidst all of this information, right? As I mentioned, our theme is opposing Jesus, and you don't have to hate Jesus outright to oppose him. All you have to be is indifferent to him to oppose him, right? It's not outright opposition, but indifference, and that's still opposing Jesus. So he says, you've hidden these things from the wise and learned, but you've revealed them to infants. You revealed them to children. Now, is it only children that know about Jesus? Is it only children that know about gospel? Well, well obviously not. So who is, who is Matthew talking about? What, what is Jesus talking about here? Who are the, the children? Who are the infants? And so if you can you know, think of this spectrum over here, are the wise and the learned, right? These are the, the self-confident adults, right? On the other end of the spectrum would be Children, right, who really don't know a lot. When you think of a child, you know, a child can't really rely on his or her own resources to learn much of anything, right? Unless a child is taught how to do math, he or she is probably never going to learn to do that. Unless a child hears voices and words spoken to them, they're probably not going to ever learn how to speak, that they are totally reliant on teachings, on the revelations outside of themselves that are taught to them by their parents or teachers or other people. Right, they rely on that and they're receptive of what's taught to them. Jesus would say in a, in a few chapters later in Matthew 18 that you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless you turn and become like children. And this just really speaks to the upside downness of Jesus' kingdom. We see that Jesus loves the little children, right? That's a little uh, song that we might have grown up singing that he loves all the children of the world. We know that Jesus had so much work to do in his ministry here on earth, but yet he always seemed to have the leisure of a child as he went about it. We know that Jesus didn't heal every single person that came across his path, but when he heard the cry of a mother or a father, Jesus, my son, my daughter is sick, please come and help. He just simply couldn't refuse. When we look at the gospels that Jesus had three resurrections of people, and two of the three were of children, it was the little boy's lunch of, you know, a little Hebrew lunchable of the five loaves and the two fishes that he used to multiply to feed the crowds, right? And there's just so much of, the, of uh, this, this child theme of Jesus loving the children. Well, what is, about the, what is it about that children that Jesus is trying to communicate to us? And it's simply this, is that the child has nothing but reliance on his parent, that they have to receive things outside of themselves, teachings outside of themselves to learn. And they have simple faith. And simple faith is what Jesus really desires of us. And this is what he's chosen, the Father's chosen to reveal these things. Not just the wise and the learned, but to the child, to the infant, to the one, the person who has simple faith and is willing to listen and accept what he has to say. And this kind of comes up uh, also in the Gospels, the parable of the sower. Uh, that some seed, when it's scattered, it falls on the rocks. Uh, it falls on the path and the birds come up and they eat it. Some fall on, on the rocks and they take root, but there's no depth of soil. And so when they, the plants grow up, uh, they, just, they wilt from the sun. Some grow among thorns and they're choked out by the thorns, the worries, the anxieties of the world. But some find good soil, right? And they grow into tall, healthy plants. Uh, the thing about being human is that whenever you get two humans together, both uh, tend to uh, inevitably size each other up, right? How is this person useful to me? You know, no matter how holy we can be, we tend to have this thinking of, of sizing a person up. And, you know, I work in college ministry, and so often when, when I meet students that are part of our ministry, I think, well, well how can we use this student you know, can we make them a Bible study leader? You know, are they good at outreach? Like, how can we use this student for God's glory? You know, what are his or her skills that we can leverage? 
uh, to make this thing go well. And so there's a student I met in a community college back in Virginia. Um, and he maybe said two or three words when spoken to. The story's not about me, um, if you're wondering. But he just never said much. And when he did, it was really only about God. Uh, and I thought that was interesting. And I remember having a follow-up meeting with him. And I just presented the gospel to him. Because, hey, I didn't know if he believed it. And if he did, I just wanted to make sure he understood it. And uh, through the whole presentation, he said maybe two words. And I walked away from that meeting thinking, I don't know, God, how you're going to use this student in this ministry. Is he just going to be superfluous? Is, is he just going to sit and not really serve? I don't know. But later we went to, to Florida, to the beaches, um, on the spring break trip to share the gospel with people on the beaches. And, and I was thinking, Lord, I don't know how, and, and the student came and I'm like, I don't know how this, you're going to use this student, Father. Um, but it was like day after day, this kid comes back and he just has these stories of four or five people coming to know Christ. And he's the one that, through the Spirit, led them to him. And I was like, it was just so upside down. Um, that this student really wasn't wise or learned in our aspect of the word, but God was pleased to use him. God was pleased to reveal these simple truths of the gospel to him. And he took it and he ran with it. He was receptive to what God was trying to do with him. We keep reading in verse 26. Yes, Father, because this was your good pleasure. It was your good pleasure to reveal truth, specifically truth about Jesus this way. In 1 Corinthians 18, uh, chapter 1, verse 18 to 21, Paul writes this. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is God's power to us who are being saved. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will set aside the understanding of the experts. Where is the philosopher? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish? For since in God's wisdom, the world did not know God through wisdom. God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of the message preached. Right, we see that he was well pleased. Right, the, the message of the cross. This is the foolishness, foolishness of the world, of Jesus coming dying for our sins and resurrecting and ascending back to heaven. And this saves us. This is the foolishness that the world, this is, that world would, would find. But the Father was pleased to, to relay this message to humanity. Uh, and the Greek word um, for pleased there, and someone will probably correct me on how to say that, uh, say this, eudokio, uh, it's also the same word we see in Matthew 3.17. When Jesus is baptized, he comes up out of the water. And the father says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, right? We see the same word here that God loves, the father, he loves his son. He is well pleased with him and he is well pleased to reveal to the world uh, the plan of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. And there will be mockings of this. There, there will be people who mock this. There always will be. They might say, that's, that's manipulative. I'm not that bad of a person. How can one person die for another person's sins? I, I don't get it. Some might say he's just another revolutionary who died at the hands of a corrupt government. Some might say, can anything good come from Nazareth? Right? There, are all, there will always be mockings. There will always be people who cry foolishness over this message, but the Bible attests to it that it's good news to us who are being saved that, has, that have received this message but I don't want you to hear that you have to be um, special or have your stuff together for God to really reveal these things to you, right? There's nothing about me, no righteousness that I have that God was like, Evan Chapel, he's such a great guy. I'm going to reveal these things to him. He's going to get it, right? I'm as sinful as the next person, right? It's only through his divine grace that he reveals these things to us and we understand and we just simply get to respond to that by faith. We look at verse 27. All things have been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son desires to reveal him. We get another glimpse into the intimacy that the Father has 
with the Son, and it's this, this mutual and exclusive knowledge that one has of the other. And, you know, some of us ha might have a relationship like this on earth. It might be a, a spouse, or it might be a really good friend where you can just sit for hours in this other person's presence, and you don't have to feel like you need to be somebody else. Some of us, in the reality of living in a fallen world, we don't have anybody like that. But whether we do or we don't, even our best relationships are broken, severely broken, right? But that's not true at all of the Father and the Son, that they have been together uh, for an eternity in relationship, um, that they delight in one another, that they never tire of being with the other. They never do. Uh, and it's this relationship that the Son has with the Father is actually going to shape the rest that we'll talk about in the last three, three verses. But uh, before we get there, I wanna read just a little excerpt from a book um, that talks about uh, the reformer Martin Luther and kind of his process for moving from thinking about God as only, uh, you know, only as a judge or really only as a creator. This process of moving from there to really thinking of God as a loving father and, and what that meant for him. So it says this, not knowing God as a kind and willing father, a God who brings us close, Martin Luther found he could not love him. He and his fellow monks transferred their affections to Mary and various other saints. It was them they would love and to them they would pray. That changed when he began to see that God is a fatherly God who shares, who gives to us his righteousness, glory, and wisdom. Looking back later in his life, he reflected that as a monk, he had not actually been worshiping the right God. For it is not enough, he then said, to know God as the creator and judge. Only when God is known as a loving father is he known aright. For although the whole world has most carefully sought to understand the nature, mind, and activity of God, and has had no success in this whatever, but God himself has revealed and disclosed the deepest profundity of his fatherly heart, his sheer inexpressible love. And it's through sending his son to bring us back to himself. This is how he has revealed this to us. This is how we know he is a loving father. And the beautiful thing is, is we get to get caught up in that right, when we place our faith in Jesus, right, we're united with him and we're caught up in this relationship, this beautiful, most perfect relationship that the Father has with the Son, right, we can get in on this, but it's only through Jesus that we can get on it. And so that first section uh, kind of ends, we move on to the second, um, and I'm, I'm calling this the substance of rest and an invitation to rest. Uh, verse 28, says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And so the invitation to rest, to whom is it for? Well, it is to all. Right? This is not a members only invitation. Uh, this week, I got a, a letter in the mail. It was for my eyes only, apparently. Uh, it was, you know, only sent to a select number of people across the nation, the world, I don't know. Um, but it was 12 pages, and uh, I sort of just skimmed through it. But basically, what I had to do was sign a part of it and send it back. And what I would receive after that, I would receive uh, all of these hidden secrets that only uh, world-class athletes or millionaires know. And they're, and they're finally, you know, you, you sign this paper, they're, they're going to give these to you. Like, you can make millions in months it said I could seduce anyone I wanted to, right, these secrets, but it was only for me. I was a select member, no one, nobody else, right? The, the call to rest isn't like this, right? It is open to anybody, and the, the qualification is simply this. Are you weary and burdened, right? I think we can all, you know, here's the Blues Clues movement, like, are you weary and burdened? Yes, you are. You are, and I think this flies in the face of, Right, I have to have my schedule together. I have to have my life together before I go to church or before God could ever love me. Now the qualification here is, are you weary and burdened? Come to Jesus. That's all that it is. And Jesus is not an intermediary to rest, right? Jesus doesn't say here, he doesn't say, go over here to find rest. 
He doesn't hire a subcontractor and say, hey, come to this person and find rest. No, he says, come to me. He's not an intermediary for rest. He is the rest. But when we think of uh, the idols in our lives, uh, our, our vices, our secret sins, the places we, we run to when we, when we want to find comfort or satisfaction, right? Every single one of those things, they, they scream this to us. They say, come to me and I will give you rest, right? That's why we run to them because we want to have rest. We want to be satisfied. And a lot of these things are good, but when they're made ultimate and when they're put above God, they will always, always, always disappoint Right? They promise rest, but they can never give it. They can never deliver it. Verse 29, all of you take up my yoke and learn from me because I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for yourselves. So in, in this verse, we're introduced to a, a, a term we don't throw out a lot in today's language. It's, it's a yoke. Um, and a yoke would be something an animal or a human would put you know, across the shoulders uh, to make it easier to pull a load. It would you know, help distribute the load across their bodies to make it easier to pull a load. So a yoke would be something that makes something easier. And so the immediate context of uh, the Jewish here is when, when they see this word yoke, it would stir in their minds of, of being yoked to the law, the law of Moses, the Torah, and these people are weary and they're burdened because of their inability to keep the law, to keep it perfectly within their own strength, right? A yoke should make something easier, but this yoke is crushing them. And we can, you know, broaden this, you know, being wearied and burdened, you know, we can broaden it to just general anxieties and worries in life, I think, too. Since the undertow of so much of our anxiety is really just a failure to trust God and to obey his commands. In Matthew 23, verses one through four says this, then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees are seated in the chair of Moses. Therefore, do whatever they tell you and observe it. But don't do what they do because they don't practice what they teach. They tie up heavy loads and are hard to carry and put them on people's shoulders but they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to move them. So we read a little bit more about the Pharisees who are all about rules and ancillary rules and auxiliary rules and rules and rules and rules and rules to help you not break the other rules and, um, and, these are, and they're heaping these on the necks of the people and it's crushing them because they cannot keep them and the Pharisees themselves cannot help them and cannot keep them um, but we know that the law is good. God's commands are good. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. No, I've come to actually fulfill them. And Paul will say in, in Romans 7 that the law is good and holy. The problem isn't with the law. The problem isn't with God's commands. His commands are good. And we just can't keep them. We collapse underneath the loads, underneath the yoke of this law. Uh, there's a book I read part of uh, called The Year of Living Biblically. You might have heard it or read of it, but the point of the book is the author uh, undergoes uh, an experiment for a year and he is going to try to observe uh, every commandment in the Old and New Testament of the Bible. He's going to see how that does for, for him for a whole year. He's going to observe every one of them and keep every one of them. And in an interview after, uh, he said, you know, at the beginning of the process, he started as an agnostic. You know, there, there might be a God out there. But by the end of the process, he said uh, that he was a, a reverent agnostic, which I guess just means he had more respect for whatever God is out there. But an inter interesting thing the reporter asked him is there anything that you still make part of your schedule? Is there any law that you tried to observe that you really enjoyed and you, st and you still make it a part of your lifestyle? And he said, yeah, I love Sabbath keeping. I love this idea of rest, of taking a whole day and, just, and spending it with my family, things that I enjoying, enjoy doing, not worrying about work, right? I think we're like 
this author, right? We long for that too, for a little bit of rest in our days, which means we're looking for Jesus. If Jesus is rest, we're actually looking for Jesus, each and every one of us. We're looking for him, and I think this guy missed it because he was so caught up in just keeping the rules rather than looking at the one who fulfilled them all, which is Jesus, right? We don't need a relaxation of righteousness. We don't need God saying, well, I know it's hard for you humans to keep my law, so here's what I'm gonna do. You choose five, five laws that you wanna keep. And, the, and the, all the others you can just toss out the window. You don't need to follow them because I know it's hard, you know, just obey a few of them and I'll be happy, right? We don't need God to do that for us because that would actually harm us. That wouldn't help us at all. Um, Pastor Mark has used this illustration a few times because it works, right? A, a, a roller coaster is only fun when it's on tracks and I'm actually terrified of roller coasters, but I've heard that they're fun if they're on their tracks, as soon as you remove the tracks, it becomes even more of a, a death trap, right? You need constraints on your life, right? These are actually good. These are actually things that give us freedom, right? We need a new yoke because this yoke, this yoke of the law, while it's good, right? God's commandments are good. They expose our sin and they crush us. But we can't bear that load. But Jesus says to take my yoke and to learn from me. And learn here connotes di discipleship, right? this lifelong journey of following Jesus, obeying his commands and teaching others. So being underneath the yoke of Jesus can mean several things. One of them is that it's a volitional surrender, right? Jesus, you know, he's a, he's a big proponent, proponent of the word must, but here he doesn't say, you must take my yoke. He says, just take it, right? It's an invitation. And what can you do with an invitation? You can either accept it or you can reject it. So this is a volitional, it's your choice whether you are going to take his yoke or not. Secondly, a yoke implies service, Right, when you put a yoke on an animal, the animal knows it's time to work. When you put a bit and a rein on a horse, the horse knows it's time to work, right? The yoke is not a rest from service, right? I think some of us in quarantine are as busier as we've ever been. Some of us have so much more free time than we've ever had. And yet, I think, for those that have a whole lot more free time, I think we wouldn't say that we're that much more rested because we have all this more free time because we were meant for, for meaningful work, right? And we, when we don't have that opportunity to have meaningful work, our hearts tend to become restless. So this rest isn't just a, an extended vacation. This isn't just a physical rest. Um, it's service, it's duty, it's working for God that your, your job is different now. God is near to everything you do, that he gives you strength that is sufficient to perform all of it. And Christ's love is everywhere. It's within you. And then lastly, uh, he says that uh, you will find rest for yourselves. Some translations might say for your souls. Um, the Greek word here is psyche, and that uh, just connotes a soul, the deepest parts of you. The deepest longings that you have, they will all finally be satisfied in Jesus. Right, again, this is not just a, a physical rest, but it's, it's a deep rest in your soul that all of your deepest longings will finally be satisfied in him. You know, I've sung the song, you know, it is well with my soul so many times. You know, it is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. And sometimes I sing that and I was like, ah, it's actually not right now. It's not all that well. But I know when I'm yoked with Jesus, my soul is actually well, that in him, all of my deepest searchings and desires and longings are true and satisfied in him. And then the last verse, verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And what does this mean? It's easy and my burden is light. 
So if we look at verses 28, 29, and 30, um, we can kind of see that there's a, a structure to it, almost a parallel structure to these three verses. If you look at verse 28, the first part, 28a and verse 30, it says, all of you who are weary and burdened, in verse 30, Jesus says, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And so you kind of have these two adjectives, that you are weary and burdened, my yoke is easy and light. Verse 28b and 29b, and I will give you rest, 29b, and you will find rest for yourselves. I will give you rest, you will find rest. And right in the middle, verse 29, all of you take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart. So I think verse 29 is really the heart, the key to these three, three verses, the heart of the section. I've been saying that there's no rest outside of Jesus. So that must mean that his life was marked by a deep satisfaction and trust in his Father and his Father's will. That must mean that his character wasn't marked by chaos or hurry He's gentle and humble in heart. You know, there's parts of scripture, uh, the gospels, where Jesus is asleep. Well, everybody else is panicking. In, in Mark 4, you'll read this, of the storm on the sea, and he's on the boat with his disciples, and this, uh, there's a storm, and his disciples are panicking because the boat is filling with water, and they're gonna drown, and what is Jesus doing? He's asleep. And so they wake him up and teach, aren't you gonna do something? He gets up, says, peace be still. And the wind and the waves immediately calm and looks at them and says, where's your faith? Right, in the most chaotic moments of life, what Jesus is sleeping. Not that he's, you know, not on the job, but it, he has authority over all of these things. It doesn't perturb him that the, the boat is going down, that he can fix it. Um, when I was in college, I uh, was able to do some horse riding therapy for, for young kids. And uh, there was one horse at the barn. Her name was Beauty. She was this huge draft horse. If you didn't know what a horse, if you never saw a horse before, you'd be terrified by this thing. Uh, she was the biggest horse in the barn. Yeah, she was the most gentle, I think, of all of them. And anytime we had a, a student, a kid who had never ridden a horse before, they're super anxious, you know, they're crying, they're screaming, they don't want to do this. Uh, usually we, we would put them on beauty because we know beauty doesn't care. It doesn't care about this kid screaming and crying. It doesn't face her. You know, and eventually as the kid is on beauty and, and they see that the horse is calm and not freaking out, that they tend to become the same way too they start to actually enjoy the ride. You know, we don't like chaos and disorder in our lives. Some people thrive on that, don't understand. But for the most part, we don't like chaos and disorder. We want our lives to be meaningful. But the thing is, you have to fight chaos and disorder along the way. That you might strive and strive for something, but that doesn't mean that you're going to get it. If we go back all the way to Genesis and we look uh, to the garden after Adam and Eve ate of the fruit and sinned against God, uh, there was consequence, consequences to that action. And God told the woman, God told Eve that there will be uh, an increase in your pain in childbirth. And that doesn't just mean that, you know, being in labor is gonna hurt, uh, it does. Ladies who have had kids can, here's a pause, you can nod your head right now. It does hurt, absolutely, but what that verse is, is telling us is that all along the way of conceiving a child to you know, giving birth to a child to raising the child up, all along this way, that nothing is going to be guaranteed along this process, right? Some of you have heard from the doctor that you're never gonna have a child for yourself. Some of you uh, who want more than anything to have a family, uh, you haven't been on a date in years and it doesn't look like anyone's coming anytime soon. Some of you have grieved the loss of a child to a miscarriage. Some of you have had children born with unexpected medical conditions and that has thrown your life a curveball, and it looks so much different than what you thought it would be. 
Some of you have raised kids up as best as you can in the way that you know, and they get older and abandon the faith that you taught them and they turn from you. You did all you could, but they made their decisions, right? All along the way, that nothing was guaranteed. And that was the consequence uh, that God pronounced uh, over the woman. But when we look at Eve, when she finally has uh, children, her first was Cain. And Cain in Hebrew means acquire. And that makes sense that Eve would call uh, her first son acquire. That I finally acquired a son, right? Because nothing is guaranteed along the way. She gives birth to a second son, Abel, whose name in Hebrew means breath or vanity or Elton John might say a candle in the wind, right? And in the same chapter, what happens? Cain murders Abel out of jealousy, right? And it makes sense that Abel's name is breath or vanity because it came and it went just like that, that nothing was guaranteed along the way. But how can we trust this Jesus? How can I know that I'm not going to be let down by him just like I'm let down by every other idol all the time that promise, promises me rest? Well, let's look lastly at, at Psalm 1. We'll read that. Psalm 1 says, How happy is the man who does not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of sinners or join a group of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. He's like a tree planted beside streams of water that bears its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not survive the judgment. And sinners will not be in the community of the righteous, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. Who does this psalm remind you of? It reminds me of Jesus. That many times, Jesus, he stood in the way of the wicked. He heard their advice, but he did not take it. Think of him in the wilderness with Satan, right? Satan, three times, you bow down to me, I will give you all these kingdoms. Jesus didn't take his advice. He was hanging on the cross and the crowd yelled at him, if you're the son of God, can't you come down from there? While he was crucif uh, being crucified, he was reciting scripture. It was scripture that he rebuked Satan with, right? Jesus meditated on the law day and night, he knew it. And everything that Jesus did was prosperous. Everything he did was successful. His life was meaningful in the fullest sense of the word. And he has done what we could not do. But not only has Jesus kept Psalm 1 for us, he's also producing Psalm 1, Psalm 1 in us. What the law was powerless to do, God did. The law could not bring us rest because it only exposed the wickedness of our souls. But at the center of rest is Jesus. And there we find the example and power of a man whose life was unlike any other's. He was never rushed, never ruled by a schedule, welcome interruption in his, in his agenda. He spent time with the down and outcasts. He showed the proud and self-righteous their need for him and repentance. He loved the little children and he trusted in his father's plan, you know, even if that meant going to the cross. And I want my life to look more like his and the answer to that isn't trying harder. It's not even to be more moral. The answer is taking up his yoke and following him. And so what, what do we do with this piece of scripture? What, what is some application? Uh, I have three points to consider. One is if you don't know Jesus and you've not taken up his yoke, you know, ask yourself what, what else have you yoked yourself to? What is the foundation of your life? What hope or relationship or morality or hobby or thing have you built your life on? And honestly, ask yourself, how is that going? How is that thing going for you? How has a quarantine challenged that? I'd, I'd beg you to consider Jesus. Secondly, many of you watching have decided to take up his yoke, have decided to follow him, but your life still feels weary and burdened. I'd say spend time looking at passages of scripture that are a testimony to his rest. Look at Mark 4 when 
Jesus is sleeping on the boat during the storm. Read about the interruptions in his ministry. Spend time gazing into the beauty of this man. And then thirdly, when we yoke ourselves to Jesus, that we are adopted into his family, right? Adopted into his church. The church is the vehicle for mission. It's the vehicle for reaching the lost, for sharing the hope for, and for bearing burdens. And if you feel burdened, ask yourself, am I making myself available for others in the church to bear it? You know, the burden of sin and despair is far too much for a single person to bear. That's why Christ had to. Now the church is called to bear the burdens of each other. And we can only do that because we know that Christ has borne ours. Cast your cares on him because he cares for you, yes. But we also get to bear the burdens of each other.